Welcome back to the Homestyle MMA Podcast. Sean Van Buren here for episode 16. Shout out to all the listeners or homies checking this out right now. I appreciate you. We are in for a great podcast episode today. I cannot wait to review what happened last weekend and preview this upcoming fight card. So today, we are going to be talking about one of the most feared upcoming UFC fighters on the planet and one of the greatest all-time legends in the MMA game colliding in what could have been another BMF championship fight. Kamzat Chemaev versus Nate Diaz in UFC 279. Kamzat has been probably one of the most ferocious and aggressive fighters that we have seen in quite some time in the UFC, and he is up against one of the baddest UFC fighters to ever enter the cage in Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz is one of my all-time favorite MMA fighters. He lives by anyone, anytime, any place. They can all get it, and he will be showing that in his final UFC fight of his career this upcoming Saturday by fighting the UFC boogeyman Kamzat Chemaev. Before we dive into that, it's time for the Rapid Recap. So last week, we had UFC Fight Night Gone versus Tui Vasa. It was an excellent night of fights for the UFC debut in Paris. If you haven't seen those fights yet, make sure to go back and watch this card. In particular, the prelims had some really amazing finishes. It was just a good card, plenty of great fights. The fans walked away happy with the UFC debut in France. We'll quickly run through these fights from last weekend and highlight a few surprises or exceptional fights. Let's go ahead, let's dive into this rapid recap. The night started off with Stephanie Egger versus Aylin Perez, and I told you last week in episode 15 that Stephanie Egger would take down Perez, use her jiu-jitsu, and get a submission victory. That's exactly what happened here. Egger worked her way for a rear naked choke submission win very late in round two. It was a very clean, very dominating performance for her. I thought the late opponent change for Khalid Taha to Christian Quinones would benefit Taha because Quinones is mostly a striker. But clearly, that just wasn't good either because Christian Quinonez rocked Khalid Taha for a very nice knockout victory in round one. Quinonez really used efficient movement to make Taha miss a lot of strikes. He finished the fight with a short counter right hook that dropped Taha, then he jumped on top to finish the fight with ground and pound. Excellent win for Quinonez. Benoit Saint Denis is a beast. I knew that he was good at jujitsu, but the guy has crazy striking as well. He is going to be a problem, and he pieced up the UFC newcomer, Gabriel Miranda, for three knockdowns, including a second-round knockout. This is a guy who is known for his jiu-jitsu, and he showed that he can strike with the best of them as well. It was a very high-paced, very exciting fight. The striking was incredible for such talented jiu-jitsu fighters. St. Denis landed a knockdown with an overhand left hand that he reared back and really fired it off from way deep back. It was a huge strike. Absolutely crumpled Gabriel Miranda late in round one. And then with 10 seconds left, he landed another clean power left hand that sat Miranda down for the second time in about two minutes. The break in between rounds was just simply not enough for Gabriel Miranda to recover. And he dropped for the final time just 16 seconds into round two with a short right hook from Benoit St. Denis. Ferris Zayam handed Michael Figlock his first professional loss in a unanimous decision victory. John McDessey did unleash a strong kicking attack with 29 landed kicks against Nazrat Hakparast, like I told you that he would in last week's episode, but it just wasn't enough as Nazrat got the much-needed decision win to end his two-fight losing skid. Abis Magomedov versus Dustin Stoltzfus ended the prelims perfectly. I told you last week, Abis would win this fight by finish. He found that finish way faster than I've spent even talking about this fight. 19 seconds. Abus Magomedov landed a straight right front kick that was super clean to the chin of Dustin Stoltzfus. It's all over social media. He followed it up with a right uppercut, left hook, and right uppercut to end this fight by knockout. Again, in just 19 seconds. Flawless debut for Abus Magomedov. Look out, middleweights. A very bad man has arrived in the UFC. That took us to the main event, and what I told you last week would be a sleeper fight of the night. I told you on the podcast last week, I told Nathaniel Wood on social media a bunch of times, commenting on his Twitter account, his Instagram, that his kicks would make a difference in this fight because Charles Jourdain doesn't check kicks. And that's exactly what happened. He went 22 for 24 with his leg kicks. I love both of these guys, but Nathaniel Wood got the unanimous decision win. 
Both fighters, they both have really bright futures. Charles Jourdain will absolutely bounce back in his next fight. This is just a minor setback for him, but this was a nice three-round war with these gentlemen, which is also exactly what I told you would happen in last week's episode of the podcast. William Gomez versus Jarno Ahrens was a bit of an odd fight to me. It was exciting. How the fight played out was a little bit interesting. Gomez surprised me big time going 3 for 5 with his takedowns and over 8 minutes of control. I did not think he'd take the fight to the ground, but once he got the fight there, he also just wasn't super effective or busy in those areas, which is kind of why I thought he'd want to keep it on the feet. But hey, he would get Aaron's down, hold him there, score a few points, and he'd get the win. Gomez threw a ton of volume compared to Aaron's, but only about half of it landed. Regardless of all this, it doesn't matter. Gomez got the unanimous decision win here. Roman Kopilov ended exactly how I told you that it would last week against Alessio DeCirico. Kopilov got the third round knockout win by unleashing a flurry of strikes that had Alessio backed up against the cage with just nowhere to go. That's now eight knockouts in his nine professional wins for Kopilov and back-to-back KO losses for Alessio DeCirico. Kopilov earned his first UFC win in his third appearance, which I think he was well past due for. And that led us to the Nasruddin versus Joaquin Buckley fight. I was shocked that Nasruddin Imavov versus Joaquin Buckley went to the scorecards. 24 of their combined 33 fights ended by finish leading up to this. But Nasruddin Imavov strategically worked his way to an unanimous decision win by mixing in his wrestling, jiu-jitsu, and striking just super fluidly going and taking the fight wherever he wanted it to go. There was tons of bad blood leading up to this fight and in the cage with these fighters. I felt that they put on a good performance that was fueled by anger. Imovov looked very slick and confident, and that led us to what I told you last week would be just a very exciting co-main event, where Robert Whitaker put on a pure masterclass, as he does against anyone not named Israel Adesanya these days. Whitaker showed once again that he is the 1B to the champs 1A. They are the best two middleweights on the planet. We'll see if Israel Adesanya can prove that in his next title defense against a very tough challenger. But as it stands today, right now, they are 1A and 1B. I really hope Whitaker stays in the division. I don't mind seeing him fight Izzy a third time if that's what it comes to. Whitaker got the unanimous decision win against Marvin Vittori in what was another three-round war. You're starting to see the trend, exactly like I told you it would be last week. Give Bobby Knuckles the winner of Izzy and Pereira, regardless of how that fight goes. If it's a third fight with Izzy, that's totally fine with me, and I guarantee you it's fine with the fans. They are the best two guys. Just let them keep fighting each other. Marvin Vittori, he did some cringy antics at the weigh-ins where he faked out shaking Whitaker's hand. I mentioned on social media prior to the fight, I said, this is a really tough look if you lose the fight, and that's unfortunately what happened to him. Robert Whitaker taught him some manners on Saturday. That takes us to what was an exciting main event, Cyril Gaon versus Tai Tuivasa. Gaon looked like he was in great shape. It was a great fight between two very likable fighters. Cyril Gaon's fight IQ continues to improve in each fight. His movement was as fast as ever. He continued to use those kicks to the body throughout this fight and that he's done in the past. The guy is an excellent kicker for a heavyweight. Most guys can't move their leg that fast. They can't reach it from the guy's toes to his head. He's very flexible. I mean, he's just an excellent kicker, and he was digging those toes into the midsection of Tuivasa with every kick. The fans were absolutely amazing for Cyril Gaon's fight. They sung the French national anthem for him during the first round. They were super loud. It was one of the most electric atmospheres. I do love when UFC heads over to Europe for their fights. Gaon also had a really fast jab working early. And what we learned from this fight for Cyril Gaon is his chin's also incredible. We picked Tai Tuivasa by knockout in round two, and we almost looked like a genius because Tai landed a massive right hook that sat down Cyril Gaon. I knew that we were in trouble, though, when Gon popped right up after taking one of the best shots of Tai Tuivasa. Gon then landed a flurry of strikes with a hard body kick, followed up with a four-punch combo, backed up Tuivasa. But then with his back against the cage, Tai Tuivasa landed a powerful left hook that knocked Gon back and they separated again. Every time Gon started to work his way towards a finish, he was reminded that Tai Tuivasa can put you to sleep with one hit. He had to regroup, and strategically continue his attacks. These heavyweights were throwing with all that they had, and they put on an amazing show for the fans. The second round gave me chills, with the, the fans screaming, going crazy. And by the start of the third round, we knew, everybody watching, 
the fight was not going to get past the next five minutes. In that third round, Taitui Vasa tried to fool us all. Gon landed a really clean, powerful left high kick that absolutely connected with the face of Tui Vasa. And he kind of stumbled, looked like he was hurt, got Gon to lunge in. He faked that it hurt him, and then Tai winged a huge looping right cross that just missed. I think that was Tai Tuivasa's Hail Mary. I think all the kicks to the midsection were adding up. And he said, if I connect this punch against anyone on the planet, they're going to sleep. Let me give it a try. Unfortunately, when it did miss, that was the beginning of the end. These fighters were absolute warriors. They were brawling in round three, but Sirogon eventually found his finish late in the third round with a ton of straight right body kicks where he just dug his toes into Ty's ribcage as far as he could over and over and over again. Brutal kicks. Then he landed a counter, short right hook, I'll note it a flurry of punches, and finished Ty to Ivasa. I will say, Sirogon did throw what looked like an illegal hammer fist to the back of Ty's head during that flurry, that finishing combo at the end. And that punch is actually the one that put Ty to Ivasa down on the mat. Some people are talking about that on social media. I felt like I needed to as well when I watched the fight again and I watched it in slow-mo. It did look like a pretty clear illegal hit to the back of the head, but regardless, he won. He got the win. He won the fight. He deserves a title shot next or Curtis Blades since it did come out that Cyril gone. will be out about six weeks with a broken hand. And for Tai Tuivasa, I'd like to see him in there next with a Sergei Pavlovich or maybe an Alexander Volkov. That wraps up the Saturday night in Paris, France. Let's dive into those bets. So we're going to quickly run through these with the UFC prelims. We had Stephanie Egger versus Eileen Perez. Fight to not go the distance was a homestyle gravy bet win. She won by submission. Christian Quinonez versus Khalid Taha. We had Khalid Taha money line minus 130 for a loss. Benoit St. Denis versus Gabriel Miranda. I knew the fight was going to end by finish, but I figured it had to be by submission. So he took that plus 145 and lost because it ended by knockout. Ferris Zayam versus Michael Figlock. We had Michael Figlock money line minus 200, which was also a loss. John McDessey versus Nazaret Hakparast. This was one we took fight to go the distance as a homestyle gravy bet at minus 186 for the win. And we finished the prelims with Abis Magomedov versus Dustin Stoltzfus. We went with Abus Magomedov to win at minus 265 for a homestyle gravy bet and going back for more two-unit win by knockout. For the UFC main card, we had Charles Jordan versus Nathaniel Wood. This was one of our first fights where we made two bets on one fight. We had a homestyle gravy bet going back for more double bet of over one and a half rounds at minus 315 that hit. And we also took Nathaniel Wood to win in over one and a half rounds at plus 150, also a win. William Gomez versus Jarno Ahrens. We went William Gomez money line minus 220, which was a win. Alessio DeCirico versus Roman Kopilov. We had Roman Kopilov money line minus 110. He won that fight by knockout. Nasruddin Imavov versus Joaquin Buckley. Probably the most shocking loss of the night for us. We took fight to not go the distance as a homestyle gravy bet. Minus 195 loss. Robert Whitaker versus Marvin Vittori. We took fight to go the distance as a homestyle gravy bet, minus 278 to get that win. And we ended it with Cyril Gon versus Tai Tuivasa. We took a huge gamble here. I know that. You guys know that. It's, it was hard to pick against Cyril Gon because he is such a strong technical fighter. But I just love Tai Tuivasa. We were feeling wild. We took Tai Tuivasa to win by knockout for plus 650, which lost. But man, we were close when he landed that shot that dropped Cyril Gon. I was about to go crazy thinking maybe we were going to win that bet. Regardless, we were up 0.79 units. We went 8-5 and five in our bets. The homestyle gravy bets went 5-1, and one, and our going back for more bets went 2-2. Two for two. So when I highlight a bet that I like, whether it's homestyle gravy or going back for more, those are hitting at a pretty strong clip these days, as they were 7-1 and one combined total. And my other bets went 1-4. and four. So if I don't love a fight, I don't make it a gravy or going back for more bet. Use those at your discretion, but if I highlight a fight I like, definitely make sure you're jumping on those. Talking about the Homestyle Perfect Plate Parlay, this was another excellent win for us. We mixed it up. We went with three fights to all go over one and a half rounds. We went with Jordan Wood, Makdesi Hakparast, and Whitaker Vittori all over one and a half rounds. We won that at minus 107. Pretty good night of bets. Like I said, we took the chance with Tai Tuivasa by knockout. I don't think I was going to take Cyril Gon to win by knockout, so I think that would have been a loss for us either way. 
I think if I had gone Cyril gone, I would have taken over three and a half rounds for him to win, and that didn't happen. So I think either way we would have been in trouble in that fight. But good night otherwise betting for the UFC. Let's take a look at how we did on Verdict and give out some Homestyle MMA Podcast Awards. We had ourselves a pretty good night on Verdict this past weekend. We finished in the top 25% of predictions and earned ourselves a gold medal. We picked three of the six fights perfectly, with the method and the fighter picked correctly four times, and the correct winning fighter in five of the six fights. The only fight where we didn't pick the correct winner was the Tai Tuivasa fight. Luckily, I put our minimum experience points on that fight, so it didn't cost us that much, and we earned ourselves a gold medal victory. Time to give out some Homestyle MMA Podcast Awards. There was no PFL, there was no early prelims, so we start with the mac and cheese UFC prelims performance of the night. This might be a little bit of a shocker, but I'm going with Benoit St. Denis. Huge shout out to Avis Magomedov. I know a lot of people are going to think he should be the winner of the award, but it was almost too fast of a victory for him. He won in 19 seconds to get that knockout. That was almost too fast for me to give him a performance award. I think if this was a finish of the night award, it would have been an obvious choice. But I did like that Benoit St. Denis sat down his opponent twice, then got a knockout for the third knockdown. He just had to earn it a little bit more, I think. So I want to give him the performance award. But obviously a massive shout out to Abus Magomedov. And our Chicken and Dumplings UFC main card performance of the night. How could it go to anyone other than Cyril Gaon? He had to battle through some adversity to get this win. He looked super sharp in this fight. You could see he's continuing to get better and better in the cage. Well-earned victory for Cyril Gaon. It was a great fight card this last weekend, but it is time to look forward. Let's go ahead, dive into next weekend with UFC 279. I'll try to keep it light and quick for the early prelims and prelims to keep this episode from going too long. Let's go ahead and take a look at those UFC early prelims. We have a lot of fights on this UFC 279 card. The UFC early prelims are starting at 6 o'clock Eastern time with Darian Weeks versus Johan Lainessi. Johan's two inches taller. He's a four inch reach advantage. Darian Weeks entered the UFC against two killers with Brian Barbarina and Ian Gary, and he had two decision losses. So he had some tough losses. It took him from an undefeated 5 0 to 5 2. He probably needs a win to stay on the roster since he doesn't have a ton of experience. Johan Lanessi earned a spot in the UFC with a knockout on Dana White Contender Series, but then lost his first official UFC fight by knockout in April for his first professional loss. Darian likes to mix in wrestling and strikes. He had 11 total takedown attempts in those two decision losses he's had so far in the UFC. He performed well in both of the appearances. He just ended up on the wrong side of the decisions. Johan Lanessi doesn't mind mixing in wrestling and playing the submission game as well. It's going to be a good start to the card, probably a good fight. But I do think that Darian Weeks gets the win because I think he probably learned a lot in those first two UFC appearances against very strong competition. And I think he gets back on track here. Melissa Martinez versus Ellis Reed. This is the UFC debut of 7-0 Melissa Martinez, 5-0 by knockout. Ellis Reed is 1-2 in the UFC coming off of a knockout loss and has two total knockout losses in the UFC. Her UFC win was a split decision. She is a former three times CFFC champion, but she's just not found that consistent success in the UFC just yet. At 2 and 2 by knockout, I am concerned for Ellis Reed facing Melissa Martinez, who has had three knockout wins in her last five fights. I think Melissa Martinez gets the win here, potentially another knockout added to her resume. Chad and Helliger versus Ella Tangheli. Similar in size, Chad earned a spot in the UFC with a split decision win on Dana White Contender Series and followed it up with a third round knockout win in his first official UFC appearance. Chad N. Hellinger is an interesting fighter because he's a ton of power in his striking. He had three knockdowns in his last two fights with a knockout, but his wrestling and jiu-jitsu need a lot of work. It is a hole in his game. He gave up 9 for 19 takedowns and 11 minutes of control time in those two fights. He is 3-5 and five by submission as well. He just does not do well getting taken to the ground, and once the fight is there. He has to stay on the feet to win, but he has power in the standing position. 
Ala Tenkeli is 3-1-1 one and one in the UFC and is coming off of a knockout win. He's more of a well-rounded MMA fighter, but he doesn't excel in any one area of MMA. He's very balanced. He's going to want to wrestle if he wants to win because I think his striking output is fairly low. He has multiple UFC wins where he had fewer significant strikes landed, but got a few takedowns and some control time to earn the victory. This fight's kind of more of a coin toss to me, but I am going to go with Chad and Helliger, who's on a 10-fight win streak. We're going to take him to win, and I think he probably needs to get it done with a knockout early, or he might get wrestled into a loss. Early prelims end with Norma Dumont versus Danielle Wolf. Norma Dumont is actually the number 15 ranked women's bantamweight, but this fight will be at women's featherweight. This is just an odd matchup to me. Danielle Wolf made her professional MMA debut on Dana White's Contender Series back in September of 2020 and has not fought since then. So she's 1-0, and she immediately made the jump into the pros. I understand she has a, a history of boxing. She was a professional boxer and went 27-14. and 14. Not the most impressive record either. The whole matchup's just strange. She is large for the weight class, though. She's four inches taller, has a three-inch reach advantage. That's both things you're going to want when you're a boxer. But Norma Dumont has a good bit of UFC experience against strong competition. She's 3-2 and two in the UFC, and she's coming off a split decision loss. Norma Dumont was actually wrestled into a loss in her last UFC appearance, and that will likely not be a threat in this one. So she'll be a little bit more loose, not worried about getting takedowns coming her way. She's mostly relied on her striking in the UFC, but she can mix in offensive wrestling. I think that is the obvious avenue to victory for her here, facing a former professional boxer. Norma Dumont is a large favorite, which I think is justified since Danielle hasn't fought MMA in two years. So we might need to be a little bit crafty with betting on this one. Seven of Norma's ten professional fights have gone to a decision, and so did Danielle's only pro MMA fight. So I think that will be the bet we will look at here, if it is better than Norma Dumont money line. That wraps up the UFC early prelims. Let's take a look how we're feeling with the UFC prelims. The UFC prelims start at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Jake Collier versus Chris Barnett. Interesting fight in my opinion. Jake is a staggering 6 inches taller and is a 3.5 inch reach advantage. Sounds like a lot, but if you're Chris Barnett, he's actually really used to that. He's a very short heavyweight, so he's used to being the smaller fighter. But that is a pretty significant difference. It's tough. I go back and forth. I say, man, that is a massive difference in size. But then I also go, Chris Barnett has logged a lot of professional MMA fights, and he is almost always the smaller guy. So in a way, he should be kind of used to overcoming that size difference. I don't know. It's tough. Jake Collier has alternated win-loss, 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 etc. in the UFC for 11 straight fights. I do think that he was robbed in April with a split decision loss against Andre Arlovsky. His prior loss was also a split decision that I also think was a robbery. So I think he is pretty good. He's just been on the wrong side of some scorecards. He says some terrible luck in the UFC. Chris Barnett is coming off of a decision loss and is 1-2 in the UFC. Chris Barnett, this guy, he's got a great personality. He's got a ton of power. He's a fun guy to cheer for, but I do worry about his size difference and the fact that Jake Collier is much better than his record shows, in my opinion. Power and speed are the names of the game for Chris Barnett. 17 of his 22 wins have been by knockout, and he can throw some super fast kicks. He can wing that leg up there, hitching the body, spinning wheel kick you to the head. I mean, he's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. He throws a ton of kicks for a heavyweight. Chris Barnett is a unique striker, but some of these size discrepancies are just too much for me to be comfortable with. Jake has been a high-volume striker in the past, but has also started mixing in wrestling. If he can wrestle Chris Barnett for a bit, wear him down with his size, press him against the cage, get on top of him on the ground, I hate to say it, but I think Jake Collier gets the win here, but he is a big favorite. I think Chris Barnett's a great guy, that's why I say I hate to say it. I just... Don't want to see him keep losing because he might find himself outside of the UFC. I like his personality in the organization. Don't count him out though. Chris Barnett can end the fight with one punch. Jake Collier can finish Barnett on the ground. So we're going to probably take a look at the fight to not go the distance. See what the line looks like too. I don't know. I think Jake Collier gets the win, but this is definitely a very tough one to pick. Dennis 
Tiu Liulin versus Jamie Pickett. Jamie Pickett, one inch taller, three inches longer. Dennis Tiu Liulin made his UFC debut in March and lost by submission to fall to 0-3 by submission. That is a clear hole in his game. Luckily for him, is the same hole that Jamie Pickett has. He's also 0-3 by submission. His last fight, he lost by submission. Jamie Pickett, 2-3 in the UFC. Nine of his 13 wins have been by knockout. Eight of Dennis's wins have been by knockout. It feels like both these guys probably stink on the ground, so they're going to want to stand and strike and try to get the knockout. Jamie Pickett surprisingly doesn't have a knockout win in the UFC yet. Frankly, picking anything in this fight, I hate it. I hate this fight from a betting standpoint. It's hard to have any idea what is going to happen. I think both guys have big holes in their games, and they rely on that knockout to get the win or they lose. The stats say that someone should win by finish because they combine for 25 finishes in their 36 total pro fights. But I also feel like neither guy might be good enough to finish the other guy here. If I had to pick a winner, I'm definitely leaning Jamie Pickett, but we're going to have to explore some alternate lines, possibly get creative betting this fight. Jelton Almeida versus Anton Turkalj. This is an interesting fight because Turkalj is taking this on one week's notice. Originally, it was Shamil Abdurakhimov. These fighters, they're similar in size. Jelton Almeida is just a tough guy to fight on short notice. Jelton Almeida has finished all 16 of his pro wins with 10 submissions and 6 knockouts. Both guys like to go for takedowns, but Almeida is the jiu-jitsu specialist. I think the opponent change doesn't really impact Jaden Almeida too much because Anton Turkalj and Shamil Abdurakhimov both use wrestling. It's a similar game plan to beat either guy. Jelton Almeida is definitely a very good fighter. He won by submission in his last fight four and a half minutes into the first round. He kept his opponent to zero total strikes. No significant strikes. No total strikes. That is the highest level of domination that you could possibly have, and he got the finish. So for four and a half minutes, he dominated his opponent so bad, his opponent didn't land anything. Didn't land any strikes. For, and to do that for four and a half minutes is simply amazing. Jilton Almeida dominates plain and simple. We need to keep an eye on the fight to not go the distance because 24 of their combined 26 fights have ended by finish. I think we need to keep an eye on that. An eye on the fight to end within one and a half rounds. I think Jilton Almeida wins this fight, so maybe look at a combination of those bets if needed. But Jilton Almeida may be new to the UFC, but I'm telling you, with 16 finishes and 16 wins, He'll be rising up the UFC rankings in no time. That takes us to the last fight on the prelims. Hakeem Dawadu versus Julian Arosa. Julian Arosa is 5 inches taller but only has a 1 inch reach advantage. Dawadu is 6-2 in the UFC and is coming off of a win. After losing his first 3 UFC fights, Julian Arosa has really turned it around as he's now 5-4 and four in the UFC. Quick math for you, he's 4-1 and one since that 3 fight skid. He's currently on a two-fight win streak, and this is just a matchup problem for both fighters, if that's possible. I feel like we've had some of these lately where they're stylistically strange matchups. Dawadu struggles with wrestling and jiu-jitsu. Arosa's chin has been banged up, and he's susceptible to being knocked out. Even though Dawadu's last four fights have gone to the scorecards, I think the differences in these fighters will lead to a finish. Dawadu has won seven of his 13 fights by knockout, but he's 0-1 by submission, and he can be wrestled to a decision win as well. So like I said, strong with knockout, weak with submission and wrestling. For Julian Arosa, he's a very skilled jiu-jitsu fighter, and I think he can finish Dawadu once he gets this fight to the ground. Julian Arosa is 12-0 by submission, but then 11-6 by knockout. Six knockout losses is a pretty big number for a professional fighter, in Dawadu's last loss, he gave up 9 of 13 takedowns in almost 9 minutes of control time. Here's my fear. Julian Arosa only wrestles a little bit. He may go for 3 takedowns total in a fight. I think if he gets the fight there, then he can win. He can get the submission win, he can get a controlled decision win. The problem is Julian Arosa has been drawn into striking battles in the past, and they've just not gone well for him. 6 knockout losses. For a straight-up winner, I would actually lean the underdog Julian Arosa to win on the scorecards or by submission. I keep going back and forth on this fight, as you can tell. I mean, they're just so dramatically different. Dawadu really struggles on the ground with jiu-jitsu. 
Juliana Rose's chin is coming into question. It's just tough to pick a winner on this one, as you can tell. A lot of close cards, tough betting fights on this fight night. But I think the absolute bet to make here is for the fight to end by a finish. I think their differences are too dramatic with their strengths, where someone's going to finish somebody, and that'll cover us all around in this one. Let's go ahead and take a look at that UFC main card. UFC main card will be at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it starts us off with an absolute banger of a fight. We got Johnny Walker versus Ian Kutalaba. Walker is the number 13 ranked light heavyweight, and Kutalaba is just on the outside of the top 15. Johnny Walker is an absolutely massive light heavyweight, and he comes in 5 inches taller at 6'6", six six, and he has a 7-inch reach advantage. That isn't particularly uncommon for him in matchups. He's big compared to pretty much everybody, but it's crazy to see it every time that he can make 205. He's a huge man weight cutting down to 205. He has struggled as of late, having lost two in a row with the last one by knockout. He's also one in four in his last five. Now for Kutalaba, he lost his last fight as well and is now one, three, and one in his last five. Both guys really need to win. They need to get back on course, get back to winning ways, or they're both just going to keep dropping. Both of these fighters were viewed as potential contenders just a few years ago, and they just have not been able to string together wins. I hope that Johnny Walker has been working on his wrestling. We saw some clips where he was in training camp with Kamzat Chemaev. That's a good guy to learn wrestling from, but it might be too little too late. He just got to camp with Chemaev, and Kutalaba loves takedowns. He averages 4.75 takedowns per fight. And this is where the height might actually play against Johnny Walker if he doesn't use his length advantage properly. With Kutalaba being lower, it puts him closer to Walker's legs, to his hips, which does help you get takedowns. Johnny Walker has to efficiently use his jab and movement to keep Kutalaba from getting too many takedowns. 41 of their 49 total combined fights have ended by finish one way or another. We will absolutely be taking a look at that. Neither guy's that good at jujitsu, so we'll take a look at the fight to finish by knockout if we need to. I love Johnny Walker for his size, but I think Kutalaba will get the win with his wrestling. Kutalaba will go for, I think, three or four takedowns a round. And if he gets Johnny Walker down once, I don't think that Johnny can work his way back up. Kutalaba has faced easier competition up to this point in their careers, but he just needs to fight cautiously in the first round. And then I think he can pour it on after that. Both fighters actually typically win or lose in the first round, so we'll take a look at the fight to end in under one and a half rounds as well. Looking at their last 10 fights each, 13 of the combined 20 fights actually ended in the very first round. Next up, we have Irene Aldana versus Macy Chiazon. Aldana is the number four ranked women's bantamweight, and Macy comes in at number 10. Macy's two inches taller, she holds a three and a half inch reach advantage. Irene Aldana, 3-1 in her last four. She had a knockout victory in her last time out. Macy's also 3-1 in her last four, but they all went to a decision. There's a pretty big difference between these two fighters. Macy Chiazon likes to use her wrestling to get control on the ground and then grind out a victory from there. Irene Aldana has to keep this fight standing if she wants to win. That is my concern for Irene Aldana. In her most recent loss... She gave up 5 of 14 takedowns to the legendary striker, Holly Holm. Holm doesn't wrestle, and Aldana was out-wrestled by Holm. This fight has two outcomes in my opinion. Aldana wins by finish, or Macy Chiazon wins by decision. This is a fight that I think Macy Chiazon wins. Irene Aldana has faced better competition lately, but I just think the matchup is not great for Irene Aldana. With the height and length disadvantages, Irene Aldana will have to fight her way into distance as well if she wants to try to win. Hopefully Macy Chiazon gets her timing right, she ducks under a shot and gets herself some takedowns. Once there, I think Macy can grind out the round, score some points with striking, control points with control time, and get a decision win. This fight, I think, could bore some fans, but that's how it goes sometimes. Aldana can end this fight in any moment, so that will hopefully keep them into this fight. I think Aldana has the finishing potential. I think Macy Chiazon, who's going to win, has the potential to control this fight on the ground and basically grind out a decision victory. 
These next three fights are going to be very hard to break down. All six fighters are fan favorite fighters. It sucks that someone has to lose in these matchups, but we have to go ahead and dive into it. The first very interesting but difficult matchup to discuss is Kevin Holland versus Daniel Rodriguez. This would be the people's main event if not for the actual main event also being fan favorite fighters. These two guys have been some of the most active fighters in the UFC since they joined the organization just a few years ago, and they're both incredibly exciting. Holland has a 2-inch height and 7-inch reach advantage. If you don't know, just Google Kevin Holland and probably crime. The guy has stopped, I think, three total serious crimes in the last two years. I believe one was a carjacking and the two others were possibly shootings, where he was able to subdue the threats. I love both of these fighters. It's a shame that someone has to lose. Kevin is on a two-fight win streak, and Rodriguez has won three in a row. Both guys prefer striking. I think they're going to stand and bang until this one ends. They both like to put on a show. They like to put on a nice performance for the fans. And I think they both know standing and banging is going to give the fans the best show. They could take. I think Kevin Holland could take it to the ground. I think he has a slight advantage there. I think he's a little bit better offensively on the ground. So he could go for a takedown if he starts falling behind. But this is the type of fight where if one of these guys can knock out the other on the feet, that is a very impressive thing to do, and it would gain them even more fans behind them. Daniel Rodriguez has one of the highest significant strikes landing per minute stats in the UFC, with 8.06 significant strikes per minute. Kevin Holland's weakness is defensive wrestling, but that's just not what Daniel Rodriguez wants to do anyways. These guys are a combined 19-0 by knockout. They also... Both use a full arsenal of striking with punches and kicks very efficiently. This could be a very impressive kickboxing style matchup. I'm a huge fan of Kevin Holland as a person, as a fighter. He's extremely exciting. He's got a great personality. But I do think that Daniel Rodriguez gets the win here. He will have to work his way inside of Holland's length. But he has really impressive striking output. Really impressive boxing. I think he might take a jab or two to work his way inside. But he's really good with combos. Maybe he takes a jab or two to get inside, but then he'll throw a four or five strike boxing combo. This is not a fight I think you want to miss. This potential to be fight of the night and could deliver us a fight of the year candidate. You don't want to miss this fight. This is what I'll say. I think D-Rod gets the win, but I'm hoping for a three round war with both men walking away looking like beasts, hopefully. That takes us to our co-main event, Lee Jung Lang versus Tony Ferguson. Lee Jung Lang is the number 14 ranked welterweight, and Tony Ferguson is making his welterweight debut, moving up from lightweight where he's ranked number 11. What do we do here, folks? What do we do? This is a tough one. I'm about to ask you the same question in the fight after this. Tony Ferguson had a legendary run. He almost had fights with Khabib Nurmagomedov multiple times that just never worked out. Those were cursed. But he is now on a spiral downward. A lot of diehard fans remember his 12-fight win streak in the UFC. All in the UFC. All 12 fights. That's really impressive. That's against elite competition in the most elite MMA organization. Lately, he's on a four-fight losing streak. He's not looked very good in most of those fights. He's looked best probably in the last one, which is nice. But Father Time is catching up with him with his 33 professional MMA wars at 38 years old. Even with him looking probably the best in the most recent of the four fights, he got his face kicked to the moon in a knockout loss. So, how good is that? I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't a great result for him, but he does have a 5-inch reach advantage in this fight going against the leech, Li Lang. The leech is 2-2 two two in his last four fights, and he is looking to build some momentum after a win his last time out. What do we do here? I mean, what, what do we do? Tony the Legend struggling big time lately or Li Zhang Lang nicknamed the Leech because the guy is he's so good. <sighs> this is what we do. Tony has only been knocked out twice as a pro, but each of those knockouts were within those last four losses. Li Zhang Lang is 10-0 by knockout. I do not want to see Tony get put to sleep again. It's tough for me to see any other result, though. I mean, the Leech is 4-2 by submission, and Tony Ferguson definitely has the advantage there at 9-1 by submission. The problem is that Tony Ferguson doesn't really go for takedowns. He can handle himself once the fight goes there and he's in a favorable position, 
And I just don't think the leech will go to the ground in this one. I think the leech knows he can knock him out on the feet. He's going to try to stay standing. Both fighters struggle with defensive wrestling. So maybe they will try a few takedowns, even though it's not usually their strategy, just because both guys aren't great at defending takedowns. I hate to say it. It feels weird to say. But this fight's a coin flip to me. My fear for Tony Ferguson is that this is his first time going up to welterweight from lightweight. That's great from a weight cut standpoint but I think he's facing a heavier hitter. And the Leech's last four wins have all been knockout victories. I was hoping that Tony was going to retire before his last fight. Now he's fighting again. It sucks to see legends go out like this, but I think the Leech gets the win here. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be another knockout. I really hope that I'm wrong with the last part, only because I don't want to see Tony go to sleep again. Like I said in the last time out, Tony's head got kicked to the moon in that last knockout loss back in May. That's one thing people aren't really thinking about. I don't know if fighting now, after being super knocked out in May, is enough time for him to get his brain right before getting back into the octagon. Tony Ferguson's still a legend, but he hasn't won in the cage since mid-2019. It sucks, but I think the Leech gets another knockout win here. We'll see what happens, but that is the co-main event. So it's now time to talk about the People's Fight of the Year main event fight, Kamza Chimaya versus Nick Diaz. I mean, let's go, everybody. Let's go. We have Kamza Chimaya versus Nate Diaz. These guys had some bad blood on social media. It feels like a year ago now. I didn't check the actual timestamp, but they talked some talk a while back now. Nate's just trying to get out of the UFC, and Dana White sends the boogeyman after him for his last fight. This is all very strange. If you're not super familiar with the background, if you want to look up Nate Diaz and UFC, he's been pretty pissed off with them lately, and you can look up Kamzat Chemaev and learn that this guy is on a tear right now since he arrived in the UFC as well. Kamzat Chemaev is the number three ranked welterweight, and Nate Diaz is just, I guess, describe him in ranking standpoint. He's unranked, but he's an MMA legend. These are two very bad men. Don't be fooled that Nate Diaz doesn't have a ranking. Everyone knows that Nate Diaz is one of the realest fighters to ever step in the octagon. He has the old school mindset as a fighter of anyone, anytime, any place, they can all get it. He puts that point to the test here against one of the hottest fighters in the UFC right now with Kamzat Chimaev. Kamzat has just mowed through UFC competition and shot his way up through the ranks. He's only 11-0 as a pro, so think about how quickly he had to rise up to number 3 at welterweight with 11 professional fights where some of those didn't even take place in the UFC. He finished 4 out of his 5 total UFC fights, so in 5 fights, he went from unranked and unknown to number three in welterweight. He's finished nine of his total 11 fights, which were all wins, including a potential fight of the year in April against the incredibly talented Gilbert Burns. Nate Diaz has been in some of the most legendary wars in UFC history. The former season five Ultimate Fighter winner went one and one against Conor McGregor during his prime. He only fights killers. I think these two will exchange on the feet for a while, which will really be exciting. But at some point, I think Kamzat Chemaev will get a takedown, and I actually think the fight will really be on. You don't say that very often. Fans love when they just stand on the feet and strike. But Kamzat's ground and pound is vicious, and he does have some jujitsu skill as well. But make no mistake, Nate Diaz has multiple submission wins off of his back, and he's 13 and 1 by submission. These fighters also talk a lot of trash in the cage. I think the press conference is going to get wild during the fight. Turn the volume up for this one because these guys are going to be talking serious talk to each other all fight long. I love this fight. It is the last one of Nate's contract and he's already made it clear that he'll be leaving the UFC after this fight. He's actually going to go start his own organization for MMA. I would love to see him walk away on top. I'm not sure he gets it done here. He mentioned he called for Tony Ferguson for his last fight. I actually would have loved to see that because they're both later in their careers. They both were legends. I think that would have been awesome. Unfortunately, he's got the wolf comes out Chimaev instead. Nate Diaz, with his legendary MMA career, 
has been in a ton of wars that have left him with a lot of scar tissue on his face that tends to get cut and bleed quickly and easily. I think Chemayev will get a takedown, land some heavy elbows to open up Nate. This will be, in my opinion, a bloody war. What I'm really hoping happens is I don't want to see Nate Diaz truly get finished for his last UFC fight. I think it would be awesome if we had a doctor stoppage instead. Look, I think Kamzat wins. I think he wins by finish. But I don't want to see Nate Diaz get his head pummeled in against the ground. But I want to see... I want to see him battle his heart out, never give up, and if the fight has to end, maybe the doctor ends it due to blood, which sounds crazy, but honestly, that would be how Nate Diaz would want to go out if it's going to be a loss. I think that Nate Diaz will push this fight past three and a half rounds because he is an absolute warrior, but I could see a doctor stoppage late in this fight with Nate Diaz's face and scar tissue being almost unrecognizable. I know it sounds crazy if you aren't familiar with Nate Diaz, but everything I'm telling you is the best way that he could possibly lose. So make no mistake, Nate Diaz will have his moments to shine. He always does. He'll land a few good strikes, maybe get some deep submission attempts. I think he'll potentially get close to a win a few times. But I think Kamzat's power will be too much for Nate Diaz. Kamzat will get the win. He's a super large favorite, so we'll probably go Kamzat by finish or fight over three and a half rounds, since that will be exciting to root for. I'm actually seeing over one and a half rounds. At a really favorable number, we're going to definitely take that. Uh, I'll explain that a little later on. Shocked to see that it might be in our interest to take one and a half rounds. I think that will absolutely happen. I think if the finish comes, it comes in the fourth. So do with that information what you may. But I can't, I can't not put anything on Nate Diaz in his last fight. So I'm going to sprinkle half a unit on Nate Diaz as a massive underdog. He's one of my favorite all-time fighters. I think he loses here, but my loyalty can't just bet him to lose. (laughs) So we are going to do a half unit on him to win because if he pulls off the miracle and I didn't pick Nate Diaz as one of my favorite all-time fighters, I'm going to feel terrible because this is his last fight. (laughs) I do not want to miss out on him pulling off an incredibly huge upset and be on the wrong side of it. So, expect to hear some curse words, see some middle fingers thrown around in a bloody, brutal, old-school MMA war. You're the man, Nate Diaz. I hope you enjoy what comes next for you. This is just a great fight for the fans, and I can't wait to watch. That wraps up our breakdown of UFC 279. Let's go ahead and talk about those bets. All right, let's dive into our bets. You're going to have to check our social media pages on Saturday to get a few lines that I'm waiting to see, but I'll tell you everything that I can so far. So remember, we're doing homestyle gravy bets. Those are our favorite picks of the weekend. And then we have our going back for more bets, which are going to be two unit bets. Let's go ahead and dive into the UFC early prelims. We have Darian Weeks versus Johan Lainesi. We're going Darian Weeks money line minus 132. Melissa Martinez versus Ellis Reed. We're going Melissa Martinez, money line minus 165. Chad and Helliger versus Alateng Heli. We're going with Chad and Helliger, money line plus 145 as an underdog. And we finished early prelims with Norma Dumont versus Danielle Wolf. I think Norma Dumont wins, but we're looking at minus 385 to minus 400. Definitely not going to take that. It's just not worth the risk. So I want to see what odds come out for fight to go the distance once they're available. The fight to go the distance amount, just to make it fair for the podcast, whatever it is, it's going to be a homestyle gravy bet. Even if it stinks, we'll take, or I tell you what, we'll, we'll take it if it's better than the Norma Dumont money line. Otherwise, we'll take Norma Dumont money line, and that'll be our homestyle gravy bet. That way, I got you covered either way. For the UFC prelims, Jake Collier versus Chris Barnett. This is the other fight we're going to have to wait on. I think Jake Collier wins. He's around minus 400, so I want to see what fight to not go the distance will be. I don't love this fight, so we'll probably take the better of whichever that is. Frankly, it might not be that much better. We might end up having to take Jake Collier money line around minus 400, which will suck. But I don't feel that confident about this fight. So hopefully fights not go the distance will be a little bit better. Unfortunately, Chris Barnett is a finisher as well, so it just might not be. Dennis Tiuliulin versus Jamie Pickett. Like I told you earlier in the breakdown, I just don't like this fight from a betting standpoint. I think you could maybe go Jamie Pickett money line if you want a money line winner. 
but we're just going to take this fight to go the distance at minus 125. Jailton Almeida versus Anton Turkalj. I think Jailton Almeida would be my pick for straight up. That's a huge favorite. So we're going to take the fight to end in under one and a half rounds at minus 175. That is a home style gravy bet, and we are going back for more. Jailton Almeida is a beast. I think he gets it done immediately, like he has already done many times in the past. So we're going to double unit fight to end in under one and a half rounds. Hakeem Dawadu versus Julian Arosa. We're taking fight to not go the distance, minus 106. That takes us to our UFC main card where we find Johnny Walker versus Ian Kutalaba. Like I mentioned to you earlier, a lot of their fights actually end in the first round. I think this fight ends by finish. So for a homestyle gravy bet, we are taking under one and a half rounds at minus 130. Irene Aldana versus Macy Chiazon. Uh, Macy Chiazon, money line plus 150. Kevin Holland versus Daniel Rodriguez, an incredibly hard fight to pick, but we are going with Daniel Rodriguez, money line plus 170. That is a very live dog, a chance to make some nice value. Lee Jiang Lang versus Tony Ferguson. <sighs> Tough fight, guys. Lee Jiang Lang, I think, wins, but we're going to take the fight to not go the distance at minus 140 for a home style gravy bet, partially because I don't want to rule out Tony Ferguson getting submission win. For our UFC main event, Kamzat Chimaya versus Nate Diaz. This was a shocking line to me because I get Kamzat Chimaev is a beast. The guy goes through everybody, but people forget Nick Diaz is a monster and he can survive. That guy is a survivor in the cage. Over one and a half rounds is minus 140. Hammer that. That is a home style gravy bet. That is a going back for more bet. Nick Diaz is not going to give in before one and a half rounds. I just don't see how that's possible. And like I told you, we're putting a half unit on Nate Diaz to win at plus 750. With this being his last fight, with him being one of my favorite fighters, if we didn't have him winning and he won, I would just feel miserable that I missed out on it. That takes us to the homestyle perfect plate parlay. We're going with Jailton Almeida money line, Johnny Walker versus Ian Kutulaba under two and a half rounds, and Kamzat Chemaev Nate Diaz over one and a half rounds for plus 174. That wraps up our bets. I'm actually really excited for this card. There's some fights I just really don't like from a betting standpoint. But that's because I think they're so close. I think there's a lot of coin flip fights. There's a chance the main event can shock us. I don't know. I can't miss this fight. Nate Diaz is a legend. Make sure you check out the social media Saturday morning for those two fights that we are waiting for alternate lines for. It's been fun, homies. Y'all enjoy your Saturday. Let's go ahead and wrap up the podcast. As always, please bet responsibly. If you have a gambling problem, call your state's hotline. I'll be posting my additional picks that we are leaving off prior to the events on Saturday on social media for the podcast, including my verdict scorecard predictions. Make sure you keep an eye out for those. Please go follow at the Homestyle MMA Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Homestyle MMA Pod on Twitter. Check out the Homestyle MMA Podcast.podbean.com for additional information about the podcast. It's been great having you guys with us. I appreciate the homies checking in and listening to these episodes, interacting on social media. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe, like, comment, review. Next week, we'll do our rapid recap from this card and preview next week's matchups. Till next time, this was Sean Van Buren on the Homestyle MMA Podcast. Y'all have a good one. <laughs>